Satellite Network Affiliates presents The Seminar Link with Art Linkletter, Patricia Fripp, Don Hudson, and Dr. Dennis Waitley on the Supercharged Salesperson. Thank you. Welcome back. I understand that there are 12 very happy winners out there today. Congratulations on winning those great prizes, the Fripp, the Hudson, and the Waitley Lectures. Now, let's give our lucky semi Seminar Link winners one more big hand. The winners, wherever they are, Kansas City, Portland. And now I'm ready for our next supercharged speaker. From the first time I met this man many years ago, I knew he had depth and substance. I felt he was just destined for greatness, and my feeling couldn't have been more accurate because our next speaker is now recognized as a national authority on high performance achievement and is one of the most sought after speakers in the world today. In fact, this man receives over 20 speaking requests each day. Isn't that incredible? Off stage, I asked him for some of his overflow. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier in the seminar, he's the author and narrator of the all-time best-selling audio program on self-management, The Psychology of Winning. He's written many other best-selling books, including The Winner's Edge, The Seeds of Greatness, and Being the Best. With a doctoral degree in human behavior, our speaker has studied and counseled winners in every walk of life, from the Apollo astronauts to returning prisoners of war, from Olympic athletes to Super Bowl champions. Olympic gold medalist Bruce Jenner says of him, he teaches individuals like myself to turn their dreams into realities. And Super Bowl champion quarterback Joe Theismann says, Dennis is simply the best in his field. I think you'll agree with Joe. Dennis Waitley is among the best. And today, with Dennis's help, we're all going to learn how to become champions at the game of life. So let's get started, shall we? Please give a very warm SNA welcome to Dr. Dennis Waitley. Come on up, Dennis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I'm so excited I can hardly wait to wake up. <laughs> when I wake up, my eyes flicker open. I say, Phew, safe again, let's go. I got to tell you something about my friend Art, you know, we were talking backstage and we got a chance to see all the other speakers backstage and it's the first time I've ever sat through the entire presentation of all the other speakers and they're good and this is going to be a hard act for me to follow. The pressure's on. I'll tell you something about Art Linkletter. He was raised in San Diego, California where I was raised and he went to San Diego High and San Diego State College and he invented the man on the street interview way back in 1935. He was the first person who ever walked up and said, hey, tell me, tell me about it. Tell me about yourself. How do you feel? What do you want? What do you need? He's learned something that may I learn this before I reach middle age. <laughs> <laughs> I've been traveling every day for 12 years. You'd never know I was 28. I, I get jet advanced instead of jet lag. I tell you something about art. Everybody needs a role model and a mentor and you've been mine for so many years and may I learn to shut up and listen. I learn nothing when I talk. I learn everything when I put the microphone over to you and say, hey, tell me about yourself and let me hear you. And I shut up my one mouth and open my two ears and my two eyes and I say, tell me. That's the greatest value you can pay anyone else in your life. The greatest value is paying other people your value. And thank you so much, Art. What a thrill for me to be with you. Thank you. Salt Lake City. I left my, I wrote uh, a new San Francisco, I left my heart in Salt Lake City out on the plane that calls to me to meet where Brigham Young became a symbol of a name. The Mormon spirit fills the air and people care. My love waits there in Salt Lake City. And of course my wife is here, that's where she is right here. <laughs> Beneath your blue and azure mountains, when I come home to you Salt Lake City, his golden sun will shine on me. 
if I were going to raise children, I would raise them in Salt Lake City, Utah, in Portland, Oregon, or in Kansas City. I'll tell you why. No, you think, no, no, you think they told me to do this to acknowledge the audiences in the three cities, but I got to tell you something. I learned how to water ski in Portland, Oregon and the Portland Trail Blazers. I know something about Portland. I learned to water ski. I like the green, and I like the fact that you're environmentalist and that you don't compromise your values and that Californians go up there when they want to see what life is really about. <laughs> That's right. I'll tell you something about Kansas City. About Kansas City, sure, you have the best beef in the world. We knew that. And sure, you're out there in the middle of the country where the roots are strong, where you really want to get value, you go back to where? The breadland, the heart. And when I come there at Christmas time and I see the lights around Kansas City, the beautiful lights lighting up your whole city, man, I'll tell you, that's my hallmark, if anything is. In Salt Lake City, I'm so glad to be here live with you. I mean it. If I was going to raise a family, I'd raise my family here. This is where people care. But you didn't come to hear me talk about your city. You came for me to give you one idea. We're sitting, winning, never whining. Winning is coming in fourth, exhausted but exhilarated. You came in fifth last time. Winning is treating animals like people and people like brothers and sisters. Losers look up and see thunderstorms. Winners see rainbows. Losers see icy streets. Winners put on their ice skates. Losers are aggressive. Winners are assertive. Losers let it happen. Winners make it happen. Life is a do it with God for others to myself project. And I take the credit of the blame for me. For many years, I've given a program called POW. Prisoner of War, Prince of Wales with Patricia Fripp, power of women. <laughs> Could mean prisoner of your work, prisoner of your wife, prisoner of your wishes, prisoner of your world, an imaginary world. POW, psychology of winning. Isn't it funny? Life is a bumper sticker. Life is a perception through the eyes of the beholder. Doesn't make any difference what happens. It's how you take it in life. My dad was the greatest coach I ever had. He was not a good role model but he was a marvelous coach and he gave me some good and bad inputs. The best thing my dad ever did for me is he sat on my bed for 15 minutes a night. My dad looked at me in my bed and he said, son, your mom and I played Russian roulette and your chamber came up full of the best genes of both of us. He said, oh my son, I'm so proud to wear your name. I'm so proud to be your father. Oh my son, I miss my ship, you'll catch yours. I love you so much, you'll go far. I didn't know any worse. He was the authority in my life at an early age. And because he loved me, it didn't make any difference what he did in his life. He accepted me. And I went further because of that. My father, the warehouseman, who died making $500 a month. But he gave me some bad ideas, too. The idea that he told my mother that night in La Jolla, California. I was born in San Diego. And we used to go and wish. Have you ever wished? Have you ever wished you had money, that you had a good house, that you looked good? Have you ever wished you could be like them and buy furniture and live in La Jolla, California, over the ocean? We did. We looked at their homes on Christmas Eve and wished. My mom did. My brother and I and sister sat in the back of the car and listened to my mom and dad talk to each other. We never listened to what they said to us. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just listen to what your parents do and say and you, you get everything you need. <laughs> my mom looked at my dad and said, oh, Edwin, I'd love to live in a house like that. We leaned forward knowing we were going to get an input to last the rest of our life. And my dad said to my mom, you ain't never going to live in a house like that, babe. That's where the rich people live. <laughs> and they're born that way or crooked. You know, for 40 years, I believe you had to be crooked or born with it or manipulative or slick to get it or have that special look, that aerobically trim look. And all the time, I had it all the way. It was in the clay. The value is in the clay, not in the shape that it takes. Old beaver teeth, buzzard beak, motor mouth, metal mouth, and turtle breath. And with me, they said the turtle died. <laughs> I said, oh, no. And they called me Dumbo ears. And I had big ears. I still do, but they don't, they're covered with what hair I have left. <laughs> two hand glider ears, two taxi cab doors open. Conditioning in childhood, labels and put downs. Is it a fur coat you wear? Do you ever get over the labels you wear? Everything you and I will ever be will be observation, imitation, repetition, internalization. I'd like to play a game with you. 
Are you ready, Kansas City? You better be. Are you ready, Portland? And we're ready here in Salt Lake? All right. If you haven't heard it before, go along. If you've heard it before, don't play. Now, be fair. Say the word for me if you haven't heard it. Pots. Say it out loud. Pots. Spell it. P-O-T-S. Say it again. Pots. Spell it again. P-O-T-S. Say it once more. Pots. Spell it again. P-O-T-S. Say it one last time. Pots. Spell it again. P-O-T-S. What do you do when you come to a green light? Isn't that funny? I said stop and the light was green. Green means go, but this jerk stood up here on the platform and went pots, 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 pots. My mind went pots is stop spelled backwards. So I went stop, 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 stop. Brought my car up to the green light. They hit me from behind. I blew up at the intersection. The highway patrolman says, sir, why did you stop? It was green. I said, I didn't want to. I watched Sam Donaldson last night. And, uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to stop, but green means stop now because it's pot spelled backward. You always move back to where you came from. And you always repeat what you thought it would be like again. Be careful what kind of condition you put in your children in your mind observation imitation repetition I tell my kids clean up your room they look at my garage <laughs> I tell them not to take drugs and they check my eyes when I come in from a reception I tell my children to be honest I've got an escort radar scanner in my car and my tax return shows no income for the third straight year <laughs> I tell my kids a lot of things and I tell my clients a lot of things and I tell people a lot of things but they don't listen they just watch I'd rather watch a winner than hear one any day. So please, my loving leader, let your life show me the way, for I am but a mirror of how you live today. I may misunderstand you, Dad, and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. The best of all the leaders are the ones who live their deeds, for to see the truth in action is what every youngster needs. I'd rather watch a winner than hear one any day. What are you going to tell me, Dad, about being the best and the supercharged salesman? I said, <laughs> nothing, I'll go clean the garage while you clean your room good idea and so it's example and as Patricia Fripp said and Don Hudson said integrity I've been working with astronauts and Super Bowl champions and I've been working with our Olympic athletes and I'll tell you there are five great continents in this world that are coming together as the walls come tumbling down and those five great continents that make up the Olympic rings could just as easily be five great Olympic attitudes what if they were what if there were five great attitudes that you could put inside you and your children and express all the value, competing with the world not to beat them, but for them to test you to be all you could be? If there were five attitudes, the first one I'm certain would be positive self-esteem, Olympic attitude number one. Self-esteem is the deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth. Given my parents and my background, I'm glad I'm me. I'd rather be me than anyone else in the world living at any other time. I'm not the best looking in this group. I just look my best in a group. And I can do some things. Self-esteem is the internalization of non-material value. Non-material value. You see, you must feel value or love inside before you can give it away. You can't give away anything you don't own. You can't love anyone unless you have love to give. And the three greatest fears that keep people from having self-esteem are the fear of rejection by peer group. The fear of rejection. Why do gangs form? Belong even if it's wrong. I gotta be accepted. I gotta belong. I do things that are wrong, but I wanna belong. The fear of rejection leads to the fear of change. And the fear of change keeps people from doing something different than they're now doing it. What if I do it and it doesn't work? It's a change. The fear of change leads to the greatest fear I've ever experienced in my life. I don't know about you, but my greatest fear is the fear of success. <laughs> no, what if I was to succeed? What if I was successful? What if I made money? What if other people looked at me? What if they criticized? What if I got out of my comfort zone? What if they said I was lucky? What if I was rich and had to wear a gold medal around my neck? How guilty I would feel. How sensitive, how unworthy me hunched shoulders with gold medals. The greatest limitations are self-imposed. You never outgrow the limits you set. You set new ones within which you must live. The human being is self-limiting. And you always project on the outside how you feel on the inside. You want a course on selling? I'll give you a course on selling. You know what you sell? 
only one thing, you. You only sell you. You don't sell products, you don't sell services, you don't sell cars, you don't sell computers. You sell the value of the seller. The decision of the buyer is based on the value of the seller. Let me repeat that. The decision of the buyer is based on the value of the seller. They make their mind up about you and me in the first three minutes. Is this person trustworthy? Are they valuable? Are they projecting the service that I want to buy? Are they worth the money I'm going to invest in this? In other words, they're not buying products. Cars are in every lot. Chevrolet is in, in every lot. They don't buy the Chevy. They buy the Chevy sales executive trustworthy value. All sales are based on referral and renewal. And you never close the sale, you open a lifetime relationship based on mutual trust and mutual value. Once lost, trust is never regained. One of the things I have trouble with is humility, which I do have. I don't believe in ego. In fact, arrogance is God's gift to shallow people. <laughs> oh no, you show me a conceited person, I'll show you a lightly valued self. You show me someone who shouts for service, I'll show you someone calling for help. You show me someone who's flashy, I'll show you someone who is desperate for attention. Only people with high self-esteem can afford to be modest, and usually are. They don't need to talk about it. If you got the real thing, you don't need to flaunt an expensive imitation. And so, humility is serving others with grace and value. Humiliation is when you tear yourself down so that you can make other people feel good better than your own miserable self. And of all the things I've had trouble with in my life, it's paying value in my presentation and accepting value when you say something or give something nice to me. Value paid and paying value. Accepting compliments is a tip-off to a winner or a person with marginal self-esteem. It's unbelievable how it works. I've had trouble with my own compliments. Hey, Dennis, thank you for the talk. <laughs> Sorry I went too long. <laughs> I said, yeah, you were a little boring near the end. <laughs> We appreciate what you did for our son. I said, it was nothing. They said, we'll tell him that tonight. <laughs> they said, good golf shot. And I said, <laughs> closed my eyes and swung. They said, right on, Duffer. They said, we all got together at the office and got you a present for your birthday. And I said, you shouldn't have. You spent too much. They said, we know. Just checking your value. All you have to say is thank you very much. I appreciate it. And that's all they want is an acceptance of the value they pay. My wife and I have our anniversary on May 5th. May 5th. Midnight Sun Restaurant. Atlanta, Georgia. Waiter looked like Tom Selleck on the half shell. Good looking. My wife said, wow, what a hunk. Give him a 10. I gave him a 6. He said, come on, sit down at the table by the waterfall. We sat down by the waterfall. He said, and he looked good. He was working his way through Georgia Tech. I said, give us that steak, Diane Flambe. Flame her up and roar it up. I got low self-esteem and need to attract a lot of attention at the restaurant. He said, uh, you know what, he could have said anything, but he qualified himself, you know how some people do, like, I got a hole in my shoe, sorry I'm late, <laughs> this old suit, oh my hair is a mess, got split ends, need to go to the beauty parlor, got dark roots. You know how people volunteer everything bad about them? Well, he said, when I said, we want steak Diane, he said, <laughs> it's my first week here in the job, never done anything like that before, probably spider grease on your wife's dress, may even set it on fire, how about roast beef? I said, what? He said, sir, I'm only new here. You better order the roast beef. Don't take a chance on someone new. I said, we wouldn't have known it had you not mentioned it. Give us the steak, Diane, anyway. And he did. And we put the sterno out with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> we ate two styrofoam pieces of the steak, Diane, and we chewed them and swallowed them and ate them. They weren't bad, so I gave him his pay for the day. He gave me his value by qualifying himself, telling us he was new. I gave him his pay. Paid the bill on a $30 commission. He was a salesman worth it. 30 bucks. He did what I did for 40 years. He looked at the $30, looked at me, looked at himself and went, <laughs> wasn't worth that much, so I pulled 25 back and stuffed it in my pocket. <laughs> he said it was worth more than five just to put the fire out. I said, how much are you worth? And he said, hit me again. I hit him with the 10. He winced and it finally sneaked out. Thank you. I said, it hurts, doesn't he? He said, boy, is that heavy. When I hit him with another 10, his shoulders went back, the American flag went down, the Olympic gold medal went around his neck, and he said, thank you. I said, you're welcome, you're worth it. And I gave him another 10, I was 35 in. It was getting expensive. <laughs> he walked away and he said to himself, huh, I didn't know we were worth that much, but I'll start looking for more value. The most powerful conversation you'll ever have 
is the confirmation you have with yourself. 1984, there we are in Los Angeles. She's in a red, white, and blue bodysuit. She's uh, a little under five feet. She's 17 from West Virginia. Her name is Mary Lou Retton. She could have been like me. Why me, Lord? What am I doing here? 17, the Romanians are better trained. My parents are in the stands. The piece of carpet sticking up. Oh, no, here goes nothing. Ah, but instead, she's just like you. She put her hand on her heart and began to go through the winning sales presentation. The most important voice you'll ever hear is your own. <sighs> Come on, Mary Lou, relax. Speed, power, explode, extend, rotate, plant the feet at the end. When the pressure's on, I get better, just like drill. This one's for you, mother. Need a 10? Got a 10. Just like drill. Let's go. When the mind talks, your body listens and acts accordingly. You're your greatest critic. You're your greatest coach. You're your greatest judge. When you talk to yourself, talk with all due respect. The second Olympic attitude is positive self-determination. And Patricia Fripp said it well. She said it perfectly. Who is in charge of you? Losers let it happen. Winners make it happen. Life is a do-it-to-yourself project. I've always said if it is to be, it is up to me. I take God's template and put myself in the position of the statue of responsibility. You know, there should be one. There should be a statue of responsibility standing right where Alcatraz is. Alcatraz, remember like Ellis Island? Remember the immigrants come in and go to Ellis Island and a statue of liberty lets them come in free? And if they don't use their freedom responsibly, they end up in Alcatraz as a rusting reminder of freedom lost. It's called the unfailing boomerang. What goes around comes around. Your rewards in life will be equal to the quality and amount of service rendered, period. Two ways you can tell about kids and salespeople. Internal values versus external control. It's called the locus of control. Self-esteem is based on internal value and internal control of your life. It's as a pilot light thermostat. Most people are thermometers. I hang on the wall to see how life is. I register the temperature and the environment and the deficit around me and the Ayatollah in Mount St. Helen. And I'm a Gemini. But if you're a thermostat, the internal value goes on, you set it up to win and high, and your body and life make every correction necessary to meet the setting of the internal standard of control. During the Olympic Games, I taught our pistol shooters how to relax. Bring your heart rate down to 47 beats a minute, please. Thank you very much. We play a cassette tape. We play the tape at 47 beats a minute. The mind learns the tape at 47 beats a minute and slows their heart rate down to 47 beats a minute to match the tape. And then the pistol shooter, taking control of the situation, holds their breath, listens to the heart, pulls the trigger between heartbeats so you will not jiggle it off the bullseye on a heartbeat. Taking control of body function too. Who's in charge here? More than you and I thought. You and me. Of course, I didn't think that way. I was a Navy pilot, a chauvinistic pig pilot. And I thought it flowed downhill from me, the lieutenant, to who? The seaman at home, my family. <laughs> I used to drive a Porsche Targa looking for Honda Civics to intimidate. <laughs> I wore my helmet with a bowl of lightning in the car, two leather bullet belts I seen a Charles Bronson movie, and I always wore a gun, take me hostage, take me dead. I wore my flight suit to mow the lawn so the neighbors would know Top Gun lived next door. <laughs> Drank Gatorade, got it all over me. Used to chase farmers on their tractors. Tractors were red, I knew they were communists. Used to give them an air show. Used to blow the sailboats back to the starting line in Newport Beach. Used to give sonic booms in the bank so they'd think Nostradamus' prediction was coming true. I swaggered in my kitchen, put my gun on the counter, took my helmet off and said, the warrior's home, he wants some food. My wife said, I'm trying to feed your new salesperson here, your nine-month-old daughter, Gerber's strained squash. She doesn't like it, so I'm giving her applesauce and Oreo cookies. I said, those are commissions after sales closed. She doesn't get any dessert. Give me that squash. You have it all over your hair, dear. <laughs> on your face, on your apron, on a tray, none in the kid. I was raised during the Depression. We were taught to clean our plate, which is why I'm chunky today. <laughs> Open up. Your dad's home. I put my helmet on. <laughs> My nine-month-old daughter's pupils pinpointed in her eyeballs, her gums clamped shut. Huh, you don't like intimidation, huh? I did what every parent's done before me. 
I swaggered back and forth and ate three quarters of the jar of squash. Mmm, your role model does it. You love your dad. You love who I am. I eat the squash, Olympic fiber-based carbohydrate. I eat it. I like it. You eat it. You like it. Simple. Get the job over with. Her eyes said it with a flash of anger. Go ahead, fat, so you like it. You finish it. <laughs> I asked my wife to leave the room, put my gun back in my holster, and did what every intimidating sales executive and manager has done before me. I took control of my employees. <laughs> Her pooch cheeked together due to my force. It's called firings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> I put your cheeks together and stuffed her mouth full of squash like every good father would do. And I held her mouth shut and I gave her the deal. Five bites of squash, gets one bite of applesauce as a commission if the squash clears. Are there any questions? <laughs> she made a decision at nine months old. She decided to die by holding her breath. <laughs> Her face turned red and purple, so did mine. I said, you're not the only child. <laughs> Before you die, you'll swallow. Now, you can't get away with it. It's just you and me and God, and he's letting me make a fool of myself. So you eat the squash, I'll let it go, give you some applesauce, we're out of here. Any questions? The angle was perfect. She made a second decision, a squash transfer. As she exhaled, suddenly I felt the pressure build up through the nozzle. The linear accelerator, Mount St. Helen, deep into my nasal pituitary area, went yellow Gerber strained squash. I made a fatal Southern California yuppie arrow at <laughs> and snorted squash. <laughs> I fell convulsing on the floor. My wife tiptoed in and said, <laughs> what happened, big guy? I said, nothing. She doesn't like squash. Don't make a big deal about it. <laughs> She's older now and left home. They usually do when they reach 30. <laughs> As they've left home and come back, I never change. You think I'm going to change? I'm like I am. I can't change. I was born this way and that's the way it is. No, you do change if you choose to change and do the things necessary. Habits are never broken. They're replaced. You simply start doing something new. You can't do two things at the same time. So, she came over for Easter dinner. Your grandma brought summer squash with marshmallow in it to kill the taste. You're in my house as a guest. You'll eat her squash or no haagen -Dazs. My daughter said, I don't like squash, I never have, not even zucchini, I'll never eat it, I always wonder why. <laughs> I said, there's a good reason why you don't like it, and I probably should be honest, integrity is the number one thing for the 1990s, your mother tried to force feed you when you were young. <laughs> she said, Dad, it was you. It was you. I realize now that I control the seven seas. I control the clock, and the clock is running on me. Time is the only equal opportunity employer. Each of us are given 168 hours on the chessboard, and the chessboard is finite, squares of time. You don't move time, you move priorities. You control your contacts. Who do you run with? Who do you model after? Who do you watch on television? Who do you listen to? You control your contacts. You control your concepts, what you think about. You control those concepts you give cause, purpose. You control your commitments. You control your communications. You control your concerns. You and I need to take the risk that will set us free. Attitude number three, if you got the deep down inside the skin feeling of your own worth, if you feel you deserve to win, and if you feel that if it is to be, it's up to me, with God's help, I'll drive, then you look for your motivation, positive self-motivation, ring number three. And motivation is motive in action. And of all the things I've ever learned about motivation, which most tape cassettes only pump you up for a little while, losers dwell on the penalty of failure and winners dwell on the reward of success. You always move toward your currently dominant thought every moment of every day. You see, you can't concentrate on the reverse of an idea. Clean up your room, you pigs, I said to my children. They went... <laughs> I said, exactly. Now you little oinkers, clean it up. And they did, and they got it messy. The next day, they know who they were. You can't come away from a pigsty. You can only go toward a clean room the way we do things in this family. That's not like you. You're better than this. This is the way we do things. Or oh, you'll do better next time. You lead toward the desired result, not away from what you don't want, unless it's imminent, physical, danger, present. Fear motivation is only used in imminent, physical, danger, present to stop behavior. But reward behavior leads you to the dominant thought you're going to. Remember in the World Series, baseball, years ago, 
I've got the film. Warren Spahn, Milwaukee Braves, pitching to Elston Howard, the Yankee power hitting catcher. Two men out, two on base, World Series, late innings. Powerful, great pitcher, knows what to do. Low and inside. Keep the ball low and inside, strike him out. The manager, an unwitting parent, an unwitting sales manager, an unwitting executive, walks out from the dugout and gives a suggestion to his great star pitcher. Whatever you do, Warren, don't give him a high outside pitch. He'll knock it out of the park. R2-D2 comes alive. High and outside, is that where we don't want to go? Sure, that's why I told you not to go there. I kind of like it now. Don't you like the sound of high and outside? No, shake it off. He just said that so you wouldn't go there. The next ball, as he tried, willpower to go high, no low and in. The ball went three-run homer, high and outside. The reverse of an idea doesn't work. The mind moves toward the fear or the goal. They're both the same. You know, you could walk the plank. You've all seen it in sales seminars before. You know how they put this big construction I-beam on the floor? We've all seen people give it at one time or another. You put an I-beam on the floor, 24 feet long, 24 inches wide. I put a $20 bill at one end. If you'll stay on the plank without going off and pick up the bill, it's yours. Huh, you kidding? 20 bucks, give me another. $50, one foot, no problem. 50, 100, blindfold. Boy, this is big deal, sales money. The guy says, it's getting expensive. You remember what he did? He put the construction I-beam on the two tallest buildings in Kansas City, Portland, and Salt Lake at the same time. <laughs> As the construction I-beam went on the roof, the deal changed. $1,000 bill, but no wind. Put a pebble on the $1,000 bill, put you at the other end. Go get your 1000 I don't need any more money now. <laughs> I don't think I need to go. Why? Because there's a penalty of failure called 24 stories of or else. Don't worry about the ground. You don't have to go there. I don't want to go there, but I will go there if I try. No, you won't. Just go on one foot. <laughs> go blindfolded like you did before. Do it backward. Don't worry about it. Go for the money. I can't go for the money because there's a penalty there now. You always move toward your currently dominant thought. As simple as something is, it's excruciatingly impossible for the body to fulfill the reverse of what you're thinking about. If I took one of your children, <laughs> hang them by one foot at the other end of the building, you're not here in two minutes, bombs away. And what happens? A lady said, depends on which child. <laughs> If it was the girl, I'd come right over. If it's the boy, we'll take our chances. She ruined the point. The point was imminent physical danger. Boom, you're there. But if there's a penalty of failure, you'll consider it. You can't move. Stuck in your tracks. It's as if voodoo is a belief system, which it is. You know, none of the stuff they boil inside the cauldron means anything. You know, it's only your belief system in it. Voodoo is the opposite of faith. Fortune is self-fulfilling. You won't get what you want in life in the long run. Ah, but you will get what you expect. Rising expectations. You rise to the expectations of yourself and significant other people in your life. It's as if there's a great chemistry set in your brain, which there is. And you will be given that energy in the chemistry to fulfill the prophecy of you. What's the most powerful drug you can take? The natural high, called endorphin, morphine within. The greatest high that a young person can get with no side effects is high expectations, goals, and driving for performance and getting excited about a destination. What does it give you? Every single chemical to give you energy and kill pain. That's where it comes from. The brain releases the endorphins, the peptides, epinephrine, the things that you need for the chemistry of the natural high. But if you're not feeling good about yourself, if you don't feel that you control your inner thoughts, then, of course, you need the other stuff that seems like it's endorphin, but comes from plants and poppy seeds and chemistry sets from the outside with the devastating side effects of destruction and death. You and I are natural, high faith believers. Like Lee Trevino. I like him. I used to be a poor Mexican, but now I'm a rich Spaniard, he says. <laughs> we were so poor when we were a boy, if my mother threw the dog a bone and had any meat out of it, the dog would call for a fair catch. 
Thank you, ma'am. Gold. I'll sign it. Gold pen, favorite color. I usually win the Canadian Open, he says. A bull of lightning hit him in the rear when he was playing golf. He said, "Woo! straighten me up. Thank, thank you, Lord. The guy is an absolute, indomitable optimist, like George Burns. He can't die. He's booked. Impossible. <laughs> he's already booked. No, he's already booked it for, for his 100th birthday party. He's got to be there. Somebody's got to be there to accept his reward. <laughs> Grandma Moses started painting when she was 75. Her first painting painted over 500 masterpieces. Well, I can think of expectations. You know, you sure you talk about Mark Spitz and talk about expecting this. We always get the flu in July and expectations. But when I was starting out in the Olympic movement, I met a young Australian, 14 years old, freckle face, red hair, with braces on her teeth, spindly legs. He had a funny name, Shane. Last name, Gould. Shane Gould, swimmer, 14 years old. The news media said, how do you think you'll do, honey? In the 100 meter, she said, <laughs> I get strong all the time. I've been practicing for a long time. I feel I'll be a world's record today. They said, little cocky Aussie, aren't you? And she said, I didn't say who'd said it. I just think there'll be a world's record. She set the world's record in the 100-meter freestyle, 200-meter freestyle. And news media said, how do you think you'll do in the longer one, honey? She said, I had a little left at the end. I get stronger every race. She set the world's record in the 200-meter freestyle. She'd been practicing a lot. That's where her confidence came from, preparation. The 400 meter freestyle the next day. How do you think you'll do in it, honey? Don Fraser, Debbie Meyer, best in the world. <sighs> I feel real good. My parents said they'd take me to Disneyland if I win. We're leaving tomorrow. Oh, I can hardly wait. <laughs> yeah, she had it going in. She had the preparation. I tried it. My house burned down in La Jolla, California, the one my dad said we'd never live in. I bought it just to see if it made any difference. It didn't. It wasn't the house, it was the value of the people living in it. Didn't matter what the house was after all. It burned down that night, Sunday night. My house blew up. I walked in the cul-de-sac and I did what every human being would do. I looked for my wife and children and they were alive, not even any smoke inhalation. I went, ha ha, safe again, fantastic. Anyone for a wiener roast or marshmallow roast? Oh boy. Fireman said, sorry sir, it was a $6.95 heater. News media blocked us out so we couldn't get to the house, and at least it was on TV. <laughs> I said, no problem. Uh, clean the garage. My tax returns are in there. I just got audited. Now I have amnesia. <laughs> clean the garage, an oceanfront lot, master bedrooms, expandable. My parents have pictures we've never seen of the family, and besides, the rest are stored in here. Peggy Lee sent me her album, Is That All There Is, to a fire. You got your health. You got your life. You have your preparation. You have your expectation. You have that belief. There's no such thing as a lack of faith. There's only good faith or bad faith. Olympic attitude number four. If you deserve to win, if you determine to win, if you desire to win, you've got to have positive self-discipline doing within what? Motive in action is target action. The mind is target-seeking or teleological by design. It's the way it was designed. We designed the navigational guidance system on all of our missiles and homing torpedoes after the human mind. The human mind sees a target, gets feedback from the target, makes every correction necessary through internal 